Lord, you are glorious. Father, you are perfect in all of your attributes. Lord, you are holy, holy, holy. You are the Lord God Almighty. And Father, when we consider your greatness, and then we look at ourselves, Father, we are amazed that you would condescend to have a personal relationship with us. And we're even more amazed, Father, that you would do this at your own expense by the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that as we study your word today, that your Holy Spirit would take your word as only he can and speak to our hearts. And Father, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing to you, my Lord, my rock, and my redeemer. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to see you this morning. Just another quick word in case you missed um, the announcement about the youth mission trip. Or but I just also want to say it again. Um, it is a blessing to know that our youth are going to be going on this mission trip along with parents. And it's a blessing to know that they're going to be a part of church planting in Houston. And so I'm asking you, church, again, to do a couple of things that are very important. One, would you please covenant with all, can we all covenant together that we're going to pray for our youth and for our young people and for our parents as they prepare to go on this trip. This is not camp. They're going to be doing hard church planting work. Can we all agree that we're going to pray for them? Good. Two, I'm asking that you please prayerfully consider and ask the Lord how you can give above and beyond your, your normal giving to help them go, okay? That's an important thing. Let's help them get there. And so, again, as, you, as was mentioned earlier, you can do that by online giving is designated. It may, I think that may have changed it, but it may still say youth camp, but that's actually youth mission trip or just through traditional means by placing them a designate, but let's support them and let's help them go. Can we do that, please? Okay. And Sophia Grace, I'm proud of you. She did a great job. It's wonderful to see one of our young persons up here uh, just sharing how the Lord is at work in her life and in the life of the group. And if your young person is not yet connected, I really encourage you to make sure that they get connected. They will be blessed and so will you. Okay, we are in our sermon series again in the book of Romans. So why don't you go ahead and turn there. A man by the name of John Miller told this story once. He said, when I was a teenager... I became fascinated, appalled, and grieved by the literature of the Holocaust. One scene that haunts me is a picture from Auschwitz. Above the entryway to the concentration camp were the words, and I'll ask Randy to forgive me again because my German is not good, but I used Google Translate, and I was listening over and over. This is the best I can do. Arbeit macht frei. The same thing also stood above the camp at Dachau. You might say, well, what does that mean? What do those words mean? It means works, work makes free. Work makes free. Work will liberate you and give you freedom. Of course, it was a lie. It was a false hope. The Nazis made the people believe that hard work would equal liberation, but the promised, quote, liberation was actually horrifying suffering and death. Miller continued, work makes free. One other reason that that phrase haunts me is because it is the great spiritual lie of this age. It's a satanic lie. It's a religious lie. It's a false hope, an impossible dream for people. They believe their good works will be great enough to outweigh their bad works, allowing them to stand before God in eternity and say, you owe me the right to enter into heaven. Oh, it's not work that makes us free. It's the love of God that liberates. It's the blood of Jesus that liberates. He died in my place. And because of that, I am free. Christianity teaches us that we are made right with God solely because God loves us we're made right with him through the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. By trusting in Jesus, not 
trusting in our works. Our works cannot and do not save us. Our freedom is not found in works, but in Jesus Christ alone. The title of the sermon series, in case you have forgotten, because it has been about six weeks, is why the gospel is good news. Let's do a quick review of where we've been in case you haven't been present so that you can know where we have been in the book of Romans. In chapter one, we saw that Paul had a very strong desire to visit Rome. He desires to go to the, 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 the power center of the Roman empire. He wants to go there to preach the gospel and to strengthen the church. And in chapter one, he makes that powerful declaration of the gospel. In Romans 1, 16 and 17, Paul said this, and if you take notes, you can write these references down and look them up. Romans 1, 16 and 17, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Good news we saw is that Jesus is still saving all who turn away from their sin and turn to him in faith. No matter your background, no matter your ethnicity, no matter what you've done or where you've been, the Lord Jesus is still in the business of saving. As chapter 1 continued, we saw that Paul addressed God's wrath, a very uncomfortable topic for many people, specifically against God's wrath against depraved Gentiles who harden their hearts against God. And we saw that in that chapter one, that, that as people rebelled against God, these pagan Gentiles, that God would hand them over to their lust and they would continue this downward spiral of judgment. And we made a very strong case that we could argue that our own culture is experiencing a Romans one type judgment right now. In chapter two, we saw that Paul anticipated objections from two groups of people the religious Jew and the moralist. Both groups would say, but wait, uh, wait, wait, wait. I'm not like those depraved people you talked about in chapter one. I'm good, I'm moral, or I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm a, a religious person, and so I'm gonna be just fine when I stand before God. But, but Paul made it very clear that both the moralist and the religious Jew were just as guilty as the pagan Gentiles because the moralist and the religious Jew have both sinned. And then in chapter 3, he just drove home that point very clearly. Write down Romans 3, 10 through 18. As it is written, Paul wrote, the Holy Spirit tells him to write these words, none is righteous, no, not one. So who's righteous? You can't fall asleep. Yeah, were, no, this is important. You've got to get this. No one is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. So who's seeking God? No one. Not the God who is. People will seek all kinds of other gods or things that might be like God, but not the God who is. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And then he culminates in Romans 3, 23 by saying, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So who's sinned? Everybody. All of us have. There's not a single person that can say, I'm good. No, I'm really good. I've done everything that God requires. No one can. You see, our standard is not one another, and we do that. Oh, I'm, I'm more moral, or I'm better than that person, right? No, the standard is God. It's perfection, it's holiness. So this is a story of every human. All of us, apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, are lost and dead in our sins and alienated from God. Jesus alone is the answer. And we saw in Romans 3 that God is the one who justifies us through the saving work of Jesus Christ. That was Romans 3, 23 and 24. And we saw that that word justified is a really important word you're gonna see a lot in the book of Romans. And here's a good memory test for you. It's been six weeks. That word justified is a legal term meaning to be pronounced in, a, in God's courtroom, not... Oh man, God bless you. You did great. 
That's wonderful. That's great. You need to remember that, not guilty. So how do sinful people stand before a holy God? Not by their works, but through the justifying work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are pronounced not guilty because of what Jesus Christ has done. We are justified freely by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. It's the person and work of Jesus who is our only hope. And now we're in Romans chapter four. That's your quick catch up. And some of you are saying, dude, you just did three chapters. Why didn't you do that in the first place? Real short. Because there are so many rich, deep things to plumb. We cannot rush through the word of God and fly over. We must dig and look and see what God's word says. We're just looking at Romans 4, 1 through 4 today. Paul is going to address this very important issue today of faith and works. And he's going to establish his argument that we are justified by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone by appealing to Abraham. So Romans 4, 1 through 4, we will break it into sections. Paul writes in verses 1 and 2, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham our father according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Okay, so Jewish people saw Abraham as that great example of what a righteous man is and does, and they prided themselves from being from the physical lineage in the ethnic line of Abraham. They called themselves children of Abraham. They placed their confidence in that, that they were God's chosen people, that they were the children of Abraham, that they had received the law and the prophets. So they were therefore, because they had this knowledge and because of their ethnicity and because of their heritage, that they're good. We're fine before God. But Paul has already established in the book of Romans, those things won't save you. Before we go any further, we need to understand if we're going to look at Abraham, how old, how did salvation occur in the Old Testament? Now, sometimes people get this really, really wrong. And the big mistake that a lot of people make is, oh, in the Old Testament, they were saved by their works. And in the New Testament, we're saved by grace. Eh, nope. Now, why is that wrong? No one has ever kept the law of God. What did we just see in Romans 3? So no Old Testament saint or no New Testament saint, no person alive has ever kept the law of God. Only Christ has perfectly obeyed the Father. The rest of us got a big F on that test. We were a part of that group that Paul spoke of, that no one does good. All have sinned. That's us. And that goes to all us. Yes, it's a story of humanity since our first parents rebelled and sin entered into the world. So not, it wasn't the Old Testament saints were not saved by their obedience to the law. Salvation has always been by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. So you might say, well, wait, and how does that work in the Old Testament? I like how Dr. R.C. Sproul explained it in his commentary in Romans. He said this, Salvation occurred in the Old Testament in the same manner it occurs in the New Testament. When Paul speaks of Abraham's justification as being by faith, that is shorthand for saying that Abraham was justified by the righteousness of Christ. The only difference between our justification and Abraham's is that Abraham looked forward to the promised one. He trusted in the promise of the Redeemer, whereas we look backward to the work of Jesus. The only difference is the time frame where the object of faith is. Abraham's faith looked forward. Our faith looks backward. But the ground of Abraham's justification was exactly the same as ours, namely the person and work of Jesus Christ. Salvation has always been by grace alone, through faith alone, alone in Christ alone. And that is Paul's point. So we need to hang on to that as we look at verses one and two again. So what then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our father, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. What Paul is simply saying is this, Abraham wasn't justified by works. If he were, he would have something to boast about. He would have the right to boast in God's presence which makes that hypothetical situation that he's talking about in verse two impossible. No one can boast before 
God. Think with me, what in the world can sinful, finite, created humans boast about before the infinite, eternal, most high, holy, perfect, all-powerful God? We can't boast in anything. None of us can stand before the God who is and say, look at me, look what I've done. No. Oh, when that day comes and we will all stand before him and we will all give an account, there will not be boasting and look what I've done. There will not be any sense of pride. That will be a terrifying day for most, according to Jesus, because the road that leads to destruction is broad. It's huge. It's an eight-lane superhighway. The road that leads to life is narrow and few are those who find it in that road goes directly through and to Jesus. It takes you to the cross. And for you to be saved, you must repent of your sins and come to saving faith by trusting in Christ and Christ alone for your salvation because he died for your sins. And that's a stumbling block for most people because they think I can work and be good enough. I can just do enough good things. Or I don't like the idea that, that it's just Jesus. There has to be many paths to God. Jesus said, no, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. So if I'm ever going to boast in anything because the Lord Jesus has saved me, I will boast in him. I can never point to myself and say, look what I've done. As we've talked about throughout our study in Romans, the only thing I've ever added to this equation is my sin. I can't brag about anything but I can point to Jesus Christ and said, he did everything for me. He died for me. So I will boast in him. So we get to verses three and four in chapter four. Paul says, for what does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. So Paul starts out by saying, what does the scripture say? In other words, he's saying, this is not my argument. This is not my opinion. This is what the word of God says. This is what scripture says. So Paul's appeal to authority is an appeal to God himself, an appeal to the word of God. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Paul is pointing back to Genesis 15. I encourage you to write this down and read this story again, okay? In Genesis 15, God appeared to Abraham and told him that he would be his great shield and his very great reward. And then God gave Abraham this amazing and unbelievable promise that he would have a son even in his old age, even as his wife Sarai was barren. And Abraham believes God. He believed God and it was counted to him, credited to him, as righteousness, meaning that Abraham was counted righteous, not because of any works that he did, but rather because he placed his faith and trust in God. It was God's grace and God's gracious promise. MacArthur is helpful in understanding this word for counted, or your version may say credited. He said this word can also be translated imputed, I-M-P-U-T-E-D. It was both a financial and a legal word. This Greek word occurs nine times in chapter four of Romans. That's a lot in one chapter. It means to take something that belongs to someone and credit it to another's account. It's a one-sided transaction. Abraham did nothing to accumulate it. God simply credited it to him. God took his own righteousness and credited it to him as if Abraham... It was actually Abraham's, rather. God did it because Abraham believed him. It was all an act of grace. God giving us what we don't deserve. This is where people stumble. Oh, in a fallen nature, we're hardwired again to think that works are going to do it. Works are going to do it. I have to do something to help God out. I've got to do something to be good enough. And I've shared with you, when, when I had to, in a, when I was going through my doctoral program, we had to do a theological survey of our church. And one of the things we, that I, I was just shocked to find out, but they said, we've been doing this for years. So all of you, are, you're going to find you have a lot of heretical beliefs in your church. And I thought, well, not us. We were actually walking through Romans. So the whole church was surveyed. And what, we, what I found out was a very disconcerting thing that there was a good 
chunk of people, around 30-something percent, that were saying, oh, yes, I trust Jesus alone to save me. But they were also, quote, hedging their bets by saying, I'm trying to also make sure I'm keeping the Ten Commandments and, you know, living by the golden rule. And they were trusting in Jesus plus works. That's not salvation. Until you come to the point of recognizing that your works and my works is just filthy rags before a holy God, you need to let go of that. And you need to come to Jesus in your brokenness and say, Lord, I cannot clean myself up. You do know that's why he came. Because we can't clean ourselves up. On that cross, this transaction is the most incredible transaction in the history of humanity, in the history of the world. On that cross, God the Son, who has never sinned, our sin was accounted to his account. And he endured God's righteous and holy wrath his punishment for our sins, for everything you and I have ever done, thought that was wrong. Jesus paid the penalty for it. And for all who call upon the name of Jesus, this incredible transaction takes place. The righteousness of Christ is applied to our account. So how can sinners stand before a holy God? By trusting in Jesus, because when you come to faith in Christ, the Father sees the righteousness of his Son. That's a perfect righteousness. It's not your righteousness or mine. Doesn't mean that Christians are perfect. What it means is that God has accounted to us the righteousness of his son. Have you ever had a, a big bill that you worried how you're going to pay? <laughs> There's a lot of snickering. Yeah, right? We've all been there. Okay, so whether you like him or not, we'll say that Elon Musk hears your story and says, you know what? I'm going to take care of all your bills. Would you be pretty excited about that? Yeah, I think I might. Oh, yeah, you know, you would. You'd be like, yeah, that's amazing. Do you deserve it? No. In a much infinitely greater way, God <laughs> has done this for us. We're sinners by nature. But you repent and you place your faith and trust. And he says, I'm going to apply the righteousness of my son to your account. That's how you and I can stand before a holy God. The works that you and I hang on to, mm -mm. they don't add anything. You need to let go of them, and you need to come to Jesus. Abraham did not save himself or make himself right with God by virtue of his works. That would be impossible. That's not what happened. It was all by grace alone through faith alone. If our salvation was by works and Paul is saying then God would actually owe salvation to us as a debt. If you worked for it, that completely nullifies God's grace. Salvation would be a debt that God owes you. But the reality is because all of us are sinners and none of us has kept the law, we all owe a huge, infinitely large debt we cannot pay. But Jesus paid it all. And as we stand before the holy God, above all of creation in our own natural state, we're all standing condemned as sinners and guilty. And again, this is why Jesus Christ came. For God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Have you trusted in Christ? See, this is amazing grace. Now, quickly... Because I need to address this matter because I know some of you read your Bibles and go, wait a minute, wait a minute. What you just said, what Paul just wrote in Romans, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Wait, James says something, but James says the uh, opposite. So what's that about? Oh, well, let me read the passage in case you're wondering because you're going to need to know this whenever we get to James. But these are actually two sides of the same coin. Write down James 2, 21 through 24. James writes, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? Some of you are going, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hang in there. James writes, You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And some of you are saying, Oh, my soul, what is happening? And the scripture was fulfilled. It says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. 
in verse 24, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And some of you are going, what is going on? Is this a contradiction in the Bible? Are James and Paul disagreeing? Okay, what if I, and this is always something I will always drill into you. <laughs> if you're going to study the Bible, what's so important? Context. Say the word context. <laughs> context. Context is very important. James is dealing with a completely different context than Paul is writing about. James is not talking about being justified by and before God. He's talking about an authentic faith being justified before others by what we do, meaning faith without works is dead. That's what this whole section is about, meaning a real saving faith, if you have truly trusted in Christ, is going to produce good works. It's going to bear fruit. If it doesn't bear fruit, it's not Real faith is just intellectual assent to certain propositions about Jesus. So James is talking about, okay, you say, and we have one people going back and forth. Someone says, oh, I just have faith. James says, I'll show you my faith by what I do, meaning I'll show you the authenticity of my faith by how I live. James is not saying that works save you. What he is saying is that if you are saved, then there will be fruit that shows you belong to Christ. So it's completely two different contexts. And Paul would agree with that. Write down Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. You need to memorize and know Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. A lot of Christians will know that, but they don't ever get to verse 10. What, what, what Paul says there is that, yes, we're saved by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. And then in verse 10, but we're also saved to do good works. God saves us and works flow out of a saving relationship. Okay? So if someone says, oh, I'm saved. Yeah, I prayed the prayer. But, but there's no fruit. Then there's serious questions to be raised. Is that person actually saved? Now, again, your works don't save you. Are we clear on that? But if you say you're saved and you don't have fruit that says, oh, yeah, this person belongs to Jesus, that's problematic. So if you put the two together what Paul is writing and James is writing in Romans and in the book of James, it goes something like this. We are saved by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone, but not a faith that is alone, meaning not a dead faith that doesn't produce fruit. If we are truly saved, our lives will reflect that we belong to Jesus. So as we close today, we need to answer a couple of questions, each of us. First, have you come to saving faith in Jesus Christ? Do you trust? Have you trusted in Christ and Christ alone for your salvation? Or are you still trying to work to be good enough to earn God's favor? Work does not make free. It will lead you away from Jesus. It will keep you from Jesus. It's looking at those works and again saying, or they're filthy I'm a sinner. I need you. And letting go of all of that and trusting in him. You must trust solely in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And related to this, this trust is not just knowing facts about Jesus or God. It's a personal response. I want to use an old illustration from D. James Kennedy. Do you see this chair right here on the front row? No one ever sits in the front row. And they should sit in the front row because that's always wonderful seating. You see this first chair right here? Okay, you're concerning me. We have two people that see it. The rest of you, you can come look at it later. Last night in the Saturday service, it was pretty awesome. We actually had a brother. I'll tell you what he did. This first chair right here. Okay, you see it. All right, question. Do you believe if you sat in that chair, it will hold you up? Some of you are skeptical of chairs, I see. Is that chair right now holding you up? Whoop, there you go. Well, you have to say no because you're not doing what? You're not sitting in it. In the same way you and I can believe that Jesus Christ can save without actually coming to saving faith and placing our faith in him. You can know all the facts about God and Jesus, but you have to come to him. So when you stand before God, he's not going to say, okay. Do you know the plan of salvation? And then you lay it out and it's okay, you're good. No, have you 
trusted Christ? Is his righteousness applied to your account? And if not, you need to take care of that. And you do it by running to Jesus. You go to the cross. Last night after the service, a brother came over and he said, Pastor, I sat in that chair and it works. <laughs> and I said, good. And you run to Jesus because he saves. Now, if you will say, well, yes, I've already trusted Christ. And then I want to ask you to just search yourself. Does, does your life reflect that you belong to Jesus? I'm not saying you're, no one's perfect here, okay? Let's be clear on that. None of us is perfect. The Lord is sanctifying all of us. But does your life reflect that you belong to Jesus? Do you love him? Do you want to know him? Do, do you want to serve him? Do you desire him? Or is he just kind of an add-on or someone you think about or you're just thinking, well, I've got my get-out-of-hell-free card. no. Does your life reflect that you belong to Jesus? If not, then perhaps you need to re-examine where you truly stand with Christ. Lastly, if you belong to Christ, are you resting in the grace that saved you or are you slipping into what we might call the Galatian error and you're kind of working doubly hard to make sure you stay saved? You know, seal the deal. Oh, Jesus alone is the author and perfecter of our faith. You cannot add to what he has done. You do not seal the deal. The Holy Spirit is the one who seals you. He is that deposit, that guarantee that your salvation is a done deal. You can't work to keep your salvation. In fact, that's going to lead you away from grace and into the bondage of legalism. His grace is what saves you. His grace is what preserves your salvation. His grace is what completes your salvation. His work is what guarantees your glorification, as we will see later on in Romans chapter 8. That same grace that saves you is the grace that you rest in day by day by day, which is why we must preach the gospel to ourselves daily. You see, it's all about this relationship. And as you abide in Christ and as you yield to the Holy Spirit who lives within you and works with you, as his word dwells richly within you, the fruit will flow, the fruit will come. You can't seal the deal. You just got to trust Jesus. So how do you need to respond to him today? We're going to have a word of prayer and a time of invitation. If you are here today and you're not certain, for, you're not sure rather where you stand with Jesus, Please come forward. I'll be in the front. We'll have a deacon on either side, and you can say, I need to nail this down. I need to know. And we'll set up a time to meet. If you're here and you have trusted Christ, but you have yet to follow through in your first act of obedience, which is believer's baptism, that doesn't save you, but it is your first act of obedience. If you need to nail that down, come forward and say, I need to be baptized, and we'll set up a time to talk about that. If you're looking for a church home and you believe this is where God wants you to plant yourself, just come forward Share that. Say, I'd like to join here, and we'll set a time to talk about that. Um, if you're here, and perhaps none of those are applying to you, maybe this is the opportunity where you just praise God for the amazing grace he's lavished on you and let go of the things you're holding on to that aren't Jesus. If you have any questions and you're watching us by live stream, send us an email at info at stonebridgesa.com. And again, we'll set up a time to meet. So after I pray, we'll have our invitation and you respond as the Lord leads. Heavenly Father, I thank you for such an amazing grace. Lord, what I deserve is justice. We all deserve justice because all of us have sinned and you were holy. And yet, God, you've chosen to lavish love, grace, and mercy on us through Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, you are our only hope. And I pray that we would respond to you today as we need to. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.